So welcome everyone to the University of Oxford Hindu Society's third event of the term in our virtual spe speaker series, Veganism, the intersection between compassion and sustainability with Earthling Ed. This event is in association with Carbon Codes. Ed is a vegan educator, public speaker and content creator. He is the co-founder and co-director of Surge, an animal rights organization determined to create a world where compassion towards all non-human animals is the norm. He is also the founder of Unity Diner, an award-winning restaurant based in London, centered around promoting sustainable and vegan food. The event will begin with a 40 minute talk from Ed and then a Q&A session afterwards. Feel free to ask questions throughout the talk via the chat feature of Zoom and we can loop back, back around to them at the end. Without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Ed Winters, better known as Earthling Ed. Hello. Is that right? Is it good? Is it working? Yeah, it's working perfect. Thank you, Ed. Excellent. Great. You're welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you to all of you who, who have logged in um, and who are listening. Virtual talks are strange, aren't they? They're, they're a very different experience. Um, but what I always say at the start of any of my talks is we do like to have questions at the end. So if anything I say during the talk uh, prompts a question in your mind, then, then do hold on to that question, whatever it may be, and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. I'm going to split the talk into kind of three different sections. And so I'm just going to briefly kind of go over my uh, transition into veganism, like what the catalyst for that change was, why I was prompted to change. Then I'll talk a little bit about the environment, we're going to see sustainability. And then at the end, we'll use that last bit of time just to talk about that compassion and ethical aspect and try and get through as much of it as we can in the next 40 to 45 minutes. Um, so I wasn't born vegan. Um, in fact, I was born into a family where we ate meat every single day and it was a really big part of the family dynamic we had. We used to laugh about vegetarians when I was younger. We didn't know what a vegan was when I was growing up. So being a vegetarian was as far as we thought being compassionate towards animals went. I remember I was 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old, and I was in an English literature class at school and we were studying a book. And in the book, there was a vegetarian character. And so my teacher had asked the classroom, she said, what do you think about vegetarianism? I don't know why she asked it, but anyway, she asked the question. And so I put my hand up in the air and my teacher says, yes, Edward. And so I said, all vegetarians are pale, weak and skinny. Right? And I remember this, this kind of like sea of silence went over the whole room. And it was very ironic because I was probably one of the weakest in the whole classroom, right? And I ate meat every single day. But I just hadn't thought about it in that way before. And I remember there was a girl not far sat close to me called Natasha. And Natasha was a vegetarian. And so I turned to look at Natasha thinking she would validate what I said because what I said was obviously true, right? But when I looked at her, she looked at me and she was so angry at me. And so I looked at my teacher, expecting my teacher to validate what I'd said. And she looked really concerned and, and worried. Now, after I went vegetarian and ultimately vegan, I remember reflecting on that quite a lot and trying to work out why did I say that? And I realized that I said it not because I was trying to offend anyone or you know, hurt anyone's feelings or whatever, but because I believed it to be true, because I'd been told that it was true. And so we grew up in societies and in a world and in cultures where the way that we see the world and the beliefs and values that we have and the lifestyles that we live are kind of wholly dictated to us by our environments, by our families, by the wider societies in which we exist in. And so we get to a certain point in our lives where we don't always critically think about the way that we live and we merely just adopt the way that we've always lived and the way that those around us live. And we lose that critical reflection. And I think it's really important that we always critically reflect on how we choose to live because ultimately the choices that we make day to day have really huge, profound impacts on the lives of others. We know this because of climate change, but even those animal products we buy, not just about the environment, but of course, the animals who are severely impacted and ultimately killed for those products. So we'll, we'll touch on that in a bit. I remember being, I think it was 16 or 17 or so, and I was ordering a pizza with a friend and my friend was vegetarian. I was not at this point. And he said to me, what pizza would you like to get? And I said, well, we should get bacon on the pizza. And he said, well, Ed, you know, I'm a vegetarian. I'm not going to get bacon on the pizza. And I said, well, why wouldn't you do that? And he said to me, I don't think an animal should die for a pizza topping. And I remember looking at it and being like, a pizza topping? What do you mean? I mean, what's the point of a pig, right? We give pigs life. They give us bacon. And so why would I ever question that? Because that's the food chain. And he looked at me and said, I, don't, I just don't think it's right. And so I, I thought about it for a moment but then I still got bacon on my pizza. It's got a separate pizza instead, right? Now the biggest change for me or the catalyst to start that big change in my life came when I was just before 21 or just after my 21st birthday. I was reading the news online, it was the BBC, 
and I came across this article talking about a truck carrying about 6,000 chickens crashing on the way to a slaughterhouse near Manchester. And I remember reading the story and feeling particularly horrified because the journalist was saying that there were hundreds of these birds who had died on the impact. I think 1,500 died just from the crash alone. But then there was hundreds more of these animals who were still alive, but they had broken bones or broken wings, broken combs, broken beaks. They were mutilated. They were bleeding and suffering on the side of the road. And I remember reading it and feeling deeply sorry for these animals, the ones who were particularly who were suffering still in that moment. I remember thinking how horrible this pain must be for them and how terrible a thing it was. But then it dawned on me that I was a hypocrite because in my fridge was a KFC because fried chicken was like my favorite food. Before, before I stopped eating animals, fried chicken was my absolute favorite. I used to go to KFC every single week without fail. But here I was feeling sorry for these chickens and what was happening to them. But in my fridge was the very reason why they were in that truck on the way to a slaughterhouse. And really the ones who died just straight away from the impact could be considered the lucky ones because if they'd made it to the slaughterhouse, their death would have been more violent and more full of fear than it was in that split second moment where they, where they died. Of course, tragic either way. But I remember seeing that and reading it, feeling uncomfortable and then feeling hypocritical. And so I'd reached this kind of moment where I had to really decide who I was and what my values were and what I stood for. And so on the one hand, I said that I was against animal cruelty that I didn't like animals to suffer and that I liked animals. In fact, you know, I regularly professed myself to be an animal lover. But on the other hand, I recognized that I was paying for animals to suffer, paying for animals to suffer in farms and slaughterhouses, wherever it may be. And that went against my code of conduct, right? We all say we're against animal cruelty, don't we? Everyone says it, no matter who you ask in society. But what does it mean to be cruel to animals or cruel to anyone? I mean, cruelty, I guess, suppose. It means to inflict psychological or physical pain or anguish or suffering onto someone else for an entirely needless reason. To be cruel to someone is to go out of your way to hurt someone for a completely pointless and unnecessary purpose. But if I say I'm against animal cruelty, but then I'm buying these products which are not necessary for my survival and also come at the consequence of causing so much suffering and pain, then that doesn't quite sit right. And so I made the change at that point to vegetarian. I didn't know about the dairy and egg industry. And so I hadn't connected all those dots, but I made that change to vegetarian. Now, as a vegetarian, I was staunchly against the idea of going vegan. It sounds a bit contradictory, but I always believed that vegans were crazy and militant and extreme. And I thought vegans had no sense of humor. And I thought, you know, dairy cows aren't killed for milk and egg laying hens aren't killed for eggs. And so what's the big problem? About eight months into being vegetarian, I saw a documentary called Earthlings, which is about a 90 minute, an hour 40 documentary. And it goes into all the different ways that we exploit animals. So it goes into the pet industry. It goes into meat, obviously. It talks about dairy, talks about eggs. It talks about clothing, like leather and fur. It talks about a whole range of different issues. Now, afterwards, I was really upset because the documentary is just full of graphic footage. It's available to watch on, on YouTube, and I would highly recommend doing so, but it's not an easy watch by any stretch of the imagination. Some really horrible things in the, in the film. And so afterwards, I was feeling very upset. Now, at that point in my life, I had a, a little pet, a companion animal hamster called Rupert. Rupert was like my first animal, you know, that I had in, in the house, first pet. And so I went to spend time with Rupert because Rupert would always cheer me up. Whenever I felt sad or felt down, I'd just give Rupert some food and he'd eat the food and it was the cutest thing that I'd ever seen, right? So I was upset after I'd seen the film. And so I went and got Rupert and I had him on my hand. Now Rupert, the hamster, loved broccoli. Broccoli was his favorite food, which as a vegan, I was very pleased about, right? Well, I am now in retrospect because broccoli is, is delicious, right? So I was giving Rupert some broccoli and he was sat in my hand eating it. And I looked at him eating this piece of broccoli and I realized that Rupert was an individual. It sounds so strange to say that because of course he was. But what I mean by that is he had likes and dislikes. He had a personality, things that made him unique. So he loved broccoli, right? Like I've said, but he didn't like kale very much. He was not a big fan of kale at all. So he had his likes and dislikes. He also didn't enjoy running. You know, with hamsters, you're supposed to get in the wheel and they run in those wheels and they're supposed to be active all the time. Rupert would never run anywhere. He never used his wheel. He used it once, right? He was on it for about a minute and they decided it wasn't for him. So instead, I bought him a ball so he could run around the apartment in a ball. And every time I put him in the ball to run around, he would just sit and take the food from his cheeks and eat. And he wouldn't run anywhere, right? Strange little character, right? So he just likes and his dislikes. 
And I looked at him and I thought, wow, Rupert the Hamster has so much about him that gives him these traits and these things that make him unique to other hamsters even. But if those traits are recognizable within Rupert the Hamster, then they must also be recognizable in the cows and the chickens and the pigs and the lambs. And even the marine animals in the ocean possess the sentience and the emotional and intellectual capabilities to make their life worthy of moral consideration and autonomy, of course. And so I looked at Rupert and I thought, if anyone ever tried to hurt Rupert, that would make me so upset and so sad. And the thought of losing Rupert, which of course ultimately was going to happen, made me really sad. But I thought, if I wouldn't want anyone to ever hurt Rupert, and I would be sad at the prospect of him no longer being around, then what gives me the right to take the life of another animal whose worth of life is still as important as Rupert's, even if they're not part of my family or in my home or my pet, they still have a worth of life that far exceeds the reasons that I can find to use them. Of course, those reasons being food primarily, and then clothing and testing and such. And so that's when I went that vegan, because I just couldn't see the difference. And I realized that even with dairy and even with eggs, animals are exploited in a whole myriad of different ways. And not only that, but they're all killed anyway. You know, all dairy cows are killed in slaughterhouses and all egg laying hens are killed in slaughterhouses. And so to be a vegetarian must mean logically to make that step to veganism because I oppose the killing of animals, but recognize that it happens in all these other industries outside of just the meat industry. Then to be in alignment with those values and morals, that step was logical. And so that's so why I made that step. And I went vegan at that point. Now I was a vegan who was very scared and very timid. I didn't want to speak up, right? I was afraid of being labeled as preachy and extreme and militant, which as you can imagine is not so much of a concern now, right? As I am preaching at you guys and in this particular virtual format, all you have to do is listen, right? So it's very preachy. So I'm not so worried about it now, as you can tell. But at the point when I first went vegan, I was very afraid of being labeled in this way. And so I kept it to myself. I was comfortable with it, but I didn't say a word to anyone. I was at university at the time and I had a group of friends and I thought that they would get veganism. I saw a documentary called Cowspiracy. Now, Cowspiracy is all about the environment and it talks about the different ways that using animals for food contributes to climate change and the climate crisis and all these different issues that we're so hyper aware of now. So being at university, I had a lot of like-minded friends who believed that protecting the environment should be of fundamental importance. So I saw Cowspiracy and I thought, I'm going to go in and I'm gonna speak up and I'm gonna tell my friends to watch this documentary because they'll really enjoy it and it's really important. So I go into university the next day. I walk in, I go up to my group of friends. I'm like, you guys, right, I've just seen this documentary. It's called Cowspiracy. It's all about how meat, dairy, and eggs is bad for our planet. You should watch it. And this girl, she comes, she comes over to me and she says, Ed, right? I mean, I get it, okay? You know, food isn't great for the environment, but it's really hypocritical of you to be preaching because as a vegan, you consume soy products, right? And soy products are terrible for the environment. I mean, look what's happening in the Amazon rainforest with soy products. And because you drink soy milk and eat tofu, it's kind of a bit hypocritical of you to lecture us when you're just as responsible for the climate crisis as I am eating whatever I want to eat. I've never been a little bit taken aback. I've not had a conversation like this before and I kind of froze and didn't know what to say. And I didn't say anything. And so then she walked off and I could tell that she was happy with herself. And I didn't like that because I knew in that moment that without having a response to her, I'd allowed her to continue doing what she'd done, but this time with an eased conscience because she'd beaten a vegan, so, so-called being a vegan in a debate. And so I went home that day and I decided to extensively look into it. And so I looked into soy farming and the Amazon rainforest. And what I found really shocked me. I mean, Casperity touches on it, but I really went into depth with what exactly was happening. And to see the amount of deforestation that's occurring, not just in the Amazon, but of course in many areas, but particularly the Amazon, for the soy production or for soy production was truly distressing. But as I looked more into it, one thing really stuck out to me. Now, the percentages vary, but the middle normally says, or like the conservative estimate is that somewhere between 70 to 80% of all the soya that is produced is used in the animal agriculture industry. There's a, a group called Soya Tech and their whole thing is investigating soya farming or they kind of pull together all the data from the different organizations and companies involved within soya farming. Now they say that 85% of all soya that is produced is given to the animal agriculture industry, 85%. Now the problem with that is that's the soya that's been produced in the Amazon, been produced in these terribly unsustainable ways. 
And I looked into the vegan products and I compared them. So for instance, let's say we drink Alpro soy milk. Of course, Alpro is a big plant-based company here in the UK and in many parts around the world. So if you drink Alpro soy milk, the soya is produced in France and in Europe, non-GM. There's a brand called Typhoon. Typhoon do vegan products, tofu products. All of their tofu, all their soy is organic and from Europe, non-GM. But the animal products, what they're being fed is the products that are coming from the Amazon. In fact, in the UK, because we don't always think about this, we, we, we think about the soy problem, we can see it in America, we can see it in Brazil, but in the UK we think, well, we see animals grazing, so what's the problem? But in the UK, we import about 2 million tons of soya every single year for the animal agriculture industry here. Now of that 2 million tons, the majority of that comes from South America, where the rainforest deforestation is taking place. Now, when we look at the soy, it's been fed to chickens mainly and pigs, so intensively reared animals mainly, but also it's been used in dairy because even when we see dairy cows grazing in the fields during the winter, when they come in, they're being fed something called silage. Now silage is dried grass, it's dried maize, it's cereals, it also has something called protein feed in it and protein feed in silage is normally soya. And so all these products that we're buying, they may come with a British label on them, like support British farmers, buy British bacon. But even though the animal's been killed in this country, when we buy that product, we're also buying a little bit of the rainforest as well, because that's the product that's going into fattening these animals to get them to the age of slaughter so that we can then kill them and eat them. Now, that's a really big problem, and I found that shocking. But the issue of the sustainability goes, of course, further than just soya farming. There was a study that came out from researchers at the University of Oxford, actually, a guy called Joseph Paul. Uh, the study is called Reducing Food's Environmental Impact Through Producers and Consumers. It was a four or five year study, and it's considered the most comprehensive analysis that's ever been conducted, exploring the relationship between farming and the environment. So it looked at 40,000 farms in 119 countries all around the world, and it, I think, got its data from 1,500 different sources, different studies. And it looked at the main problems associated with agriculture and the environment. And of course, one of the biggest problems is land usage, because land usage plays a huge part in the production of food. And so it said that globally, 70, 83%, even sorry, 83% of all agricultural land is given to animal farming. 83%, so over four-fifths of the land that we dedicate to producing food is given to producing animal foods. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem if the ratios between input versus output were similar. So if 83% of our nutrition was coming from animal-based foods, you could justify that, but that's not what's happening. In fact, only 37% of our protein and as little as around 20% of our total caloric intake globally is coming from animal-based production. And so we have a huge disparity between the amount of land that's been given to animals and the amount of food that we get as a consequence of that. It said that if we switch to a plant-based diet, this study, if the world adopted a plant-based diet, we could reduce the amount of agricultural land that we need by 75% and still feed everyone on this planet with the total amount of food that they need. 75%, which is a huge amount. And we think, well, how does that work? I mean, surely that doesn't quite make sense. There was a study done by Harvard Law School called Eating Away at Climate Emissions, and it looked at this particular problem, land usage and animal farming. It said in the UK and also in the US as well, about 48% of the total land mass of the UK is dedicated to animal farming, 48%, which seems like a lot, right? But if we get the train or we drive through the UK, what do we see? We see fields everywhere, right? Just everywhere. As far as I can see, there's fields. And in those fields, we see dairy cows, cattle being raised for meat, and also sheep primarily. We never see pigs or chickens, do we? Because they're all intensively raised in factory farms where they have no space to move and are, of course, exploited in a, in a multitude of ways that we don't see visually. But even the animals that we see in those fields in front of us are still exploited in ways that we don't see there. We'll come on to that. But that's all we see these animals, these fields, as far as the eye can see, 48%. Now, the biggest issue, of course, when it comes to resource allocation is that as we continue to progress, more and more humans are being born into this world. So 10 billion people by the year 2050 is what's predicted. So that's another 2 billion people compared to what we have now, right? 
But if we have 2 billion more people on this planet and they're being fed the same diet that we're eating now, how is that going to work? Because there's only so much land and the resources we have are, of course, ultimately finite. And so how are we going to keep feeding the world on the same way that we always have when we're struggling even now at a capacity of about 8 billion? A report from the United Nations, the Food and Agriculture Organization sector of the United Nations, said about 26% of Earth's terrestrial land surface is given to grazing animals, 26%. A report from the European Commission, or data derived from the European Commission, called the intensification of animal farming in Europe, said that about 63% of all arable land in the EU is given to producing feed for animals. So there's something wrong here and something that we need to do to change it. The Harvard Law School study, Eating Weight Climate Emissions, said that one calorie of beef requires 37 calories of plants. One calorie of pork requires 12 calories of plants. One calorie of chicken requires nine calories of plants and one calorie of dairy and one calorie of egg products requires six calorie of plants. So vastly more is going in than we get out as a consequence. Now, I think thoroughly that one of the best things that we can do to help our planet is to change our agricultural system. So let's go with that five-year study from the University of Oxford again. We can reduce the amount of agricultural land we need by 75% and still feed everyone on a plant-based diet. Now, what could we do with that land? We could do so much, right? And one of the fundamental things that would be the most beneficial is of course rewilding, reforesting, and restoring the natural ecosystems that we've decimated, of course, for a number of reasons, cities, for roads, for trains, but primarily for agriculture. So by rewilding and reforesting, we do a couple of really important things. We allow the natural biodiversity to restore because there was a state of nature report that was released two years ago, now 2018, that looked at the biodiversity of wildlife, not just in the UK, but in, in 215 countries around the world. And so out of 215 countries, the UK ranked 186 for the intactness of our biodiversity. In fact, 25% of mammals and 50% of birds in the UK are endangered. But at the same time, all we hear is about how wonderful our countryside is and how we have such a wonderful, proud heritage of protecting our landscapes and protecting animals here. We can look at other places around the world and maybe think, well, biodiversity there of course is going to be impacted but not in the UK we have such a wonderful countryside but when we look beneath the surface we see so much degradation that is occurring that is absolutely horrifying endangered animals decimation of our biodiversity so by rewilding and reforesting we allow animals to have more space to have less fear of their population sizes being decimated and to restore that overall biodiversity but a consequence of doing that, of having more trees, of having more wildflower meadows, of having healthier ecosystems, is we can sequester carbon, of course. So sequestering carbon through reforesting, through rewilding, can absorb so much more carbon than, of course, we're able to do now. Healthy soils will do the same thing. Healthy ecosystems in general, such a, a blessing when it comes to sequestering carbon. Incidentally, also the oceans as well, because of course, oceans produce a huge amount of oxygen through marine phytoplankton. Marine phytoplankton levels in the ocean have been severely impacted because of the climate crisis. So by changing our impact on the climate, we can also have positive influences on the ocean. Of course, no longer fishing is a huge part of that as well. And so we can do so much better to restore the levels of greenhouse gases in our environment by repurposing that land for a more beneficial reason. Now, of course, farmers don't have to get left aside for this because we give subsidies to farmers every single year, tens of billions around the world, hundreds of billions around the world. But even in the UK, we subsidize farmers by the billions every single year. In fact, now that we're leaving the EU, the British taxpayer will be paying 3.5 billion more pounds every single year to farmers because they're no longer getting the subsidy from the EU. And so we are paying for that extra now. And so we give so much money propping up an industry that wouldn't survive in the normal economy without the subsidies. But more importantly than that, is devastating for the environment and comes at a huge cost of life for the animals. One billion land animals in the UK alone killed every single year for the food that we consume. Billions of marine animals as well, of course. So we could use these subsidies to incentivize farmers to switch to plant-based agriculture or to rewild and reforest their lands. Give the farmers the same money they've been getting to farm animals, but give it to them to act as stewards to the land, to reforest, rewild, and restore. 
Now, to me, I think that is one of the most beneficial things that we can do. Because by doing that, we reduce suffering and we create a healthier planet for all of us, especially when this is applied on a, on a more global scale. To me, that seems like one of the best solutions that we have. Of course, when we're talking about animal agriculture, we're also talking about greenhouse gas emissions that they produce. So according to the United Nations, about 14.5% of all global greenhouse gas emissions come from animals, animal farming, which actually makes it higher in terms of the percentage than the combined exhausts of every form of transportation on the planet. So animal farming produces more greenhouse gases than all the exhausts from cars, planes, motorbikes, boats, lorries, SUVs, you name it. So it's a huge amount. And on top of that, of course, you have eutrophication, acidification, um, oceanic dead zones, species extinction, biodiversity loss, so many problems for one industry, an industry that we don't even need, an industry that causes problems to us because consumption of animal products increases our risk of heart disease, strokes, type two diabetes, chronic illnesses, kidney failure, problems that we don't want to suffer from, but are perpetuated by our consumption of animal products. And so I think there's a better way. Now, from an, uh, an ethical standpoint, of course, we have to ask ourselves outside of all of this, how do we justify what we do? Let's say that we, we take that environmental aspect and we add that to further add credibility and weight to the overall reason to go vegan. But is there an ethical and compassionate aspect to this that should also be considered as potentially in my eyes, even more profound and more important? Because one of the things that's often leveled against vegans is that we're trying to deny people some sort of personal choice. I mean, before I was vegan, I used to say this all the, all the time. I used to say, I have no problem with people being vegans, right? Like be vegan, that's cool, like you do you, right? But just don't force that on me because it's my personal choice to not be vegan, right? I'm sure we've either all heard that or we've maybe even said it or thought it. I've done both of those, had both of those things. So what does that actually look like? Because I agree that what we choose to consume is ultimately a personal choice, right? I mean, I can't dictate what you buy. I mean, as soon as this call ends, this webinar, ends you can eat whatever you want for dinner and you can eat whatever you want for breakfast tomorrow and lunch and dinner for every day for the rest of your life i can't make you buy tofu right even if i wanted to and maybe i do but of course i can't right so i can't make you buy tofu i can't make you buy chickpeas so i can't force you to do anything but when we buy animal products we buy a piece of chicken from the supermarket we buy a pint of milk from the supermarket a crate of or carton of eggs we're forcing an animal to be killed on our behalf. We're forcing an animal to endure a life that no animal would ever want to choose to then be killed in a horrible way for us and for the choices that we make. So when we talk about forcing views, I mean, who's really forcing their views? The vegan who says, hey man, please go vegan, or the person who buys the animal products and sentences an animal to death. Now it is a personal choice, but everything we choose to do is a personal choice, right? Again, when this call ends, any of us could do whatever we wanted. I could, after this call ends, go outside and mug someone, right? Maybe it's a little bit over the top, but I could do that. Doing that would be a personal choice, but it wouldn't make it moral or ethical. I could go to a dog shelter, rehome a dog, bring the dog home and abuse them. And that's a personal choice. I've decided that I want to do that. I've personally chosen to engage in that. But that doesn't mean those actions are moral, because of course they're not. And so we deal with issues of morality and, and ethics, it's not about whether or not it's a personal choice, it's about whether or not that objectively that personal choice should or shouldn't be challenged. And when we have actions or we partake in actions that have victims, those actions should be challenged and should be questioned and should be critically thought about, which is exactly what I think is great that we try and do, of course. And you guys have been here is a wonderful thing because I hope that's what we're able to do together, especially during the Q&A section as well. Critically challenge each other to think more in depth about this. And so, yes, it's a personal choice, but ultimately a personal choice does not mean something is moral or should be allowed. And I believe that what we do to animals, I mean, is cruel. But that means that word humane should be called into question, right? Because I'm using the word cruel a lot and, you know, it's awful what we do to animals, it's horrible. But people will turn around and they say to me, Ed, of course, cruelty and in horror to animals is a bad thing, but what about what we do to animals when it's humane? Because of course we humanely kill animals in this country. I mean, yeah, I agree that in China it's bad. I agree in America it's bad. I agree in Russia it's bad, but in the UK we have high animal welfare standards. 
And so the way that we treat animals is humane. And besides, farmers love their animals, Ed. So I'm pretty sure that I can trust them. But is what we do to animals humane? To work that out, we first have to understand what the word humane means, obviously, because it's easy to use terms and use words and phrases to describe something. But when we analyze what those phrases mean, that's when it becomes a little bit more tenuous. So let's take the word humane. Let's say we've got a thesaurus in front of us. We open up the thesaurus, we find the word humane. What other words do we find listed there? And we find compassion, we find benevolence, we find kindness. And so then we say, well, is what we do to animals compassionate, benevolent, or kind? And so the humane method of killing pigs is in a gas chamber. So pigs are herded into a metal crate. It's some sort of gondola system. It lowers them into an abyss that's filled with an aversive mixture of CO2. It takes about 30 seconds or so for them to die. It causes them to feel like their moisture is burning in their throats and behind their eyes. A terrible way to die. Videos of it online if, if you feel compelled to see it. But it's a terrible thing. Or we cut the animal's throats, don't we? We stun them or we cut their throats. Now, is that compassionate? I'm not sure if we can justify that as being compassionate. I mean, to be compassionate to someone isn't to unduly hurt them or to cause suffering or to take their life. I mean, you can never compassionately take the life of someone who doesn't have to die and, of course, who doesn't want to die. And so we can't compassionately take the life of someone who doesn't have to die we can't benevolently do that, then by default, we can't humanely do that either. If someone's a humane person, then it'd be contradictory to that humaneness for them to go out and kick a dog or to cut a dog's throat. And yet that's what we pay other people to do. And then we stamp a humane label on it and say it's high welfare and the animals didn't suffer. But of course, there's suffering intrinsically involved in the abject reality of taking life. And so humane slaughter is an oxymoron. And besides that, just because we have high animal welfare standards in the scheme of the world, doesn't mean that what we objectively do to animals in this country is humane. For instance, we cut the tails off piglets, we chuck the teeth out of our anesthetic. We keep sows, so mother pigs, in what we call gestation crates or farrowing crates, which are crates so small that they can't turn around in them. And they'll spend the five weeks of their pregnancies, the last five weeks of their pregnancy, in these crates. They can't turn around. All they can do is stand up and sit down for five weeks at a time. They endlessly bite on the bars. And we say that's high welfare. Or we take dairy cows, we forcibly impregnate them. When they give birth, we take their babies away from them, put their babies in solitary confinement pens where they can spend the first three weeks, six weeks even of their lives in these solitary confinement pens, even eight weeks on farms, in solitary confinement pens. No interaction, no motherly nurture, eight weeks, the first eight weeks of their life in solitary confinement beds. And so even in the best standards in the world, wherever you look, exploitation is intrinsic to what we do to animals. So how do we justify it? Of course, one of the primary reasons that we do what we do is because of taste, right? We say, well, I like how these products taste. You know, people always say to me, you've never had halloumi, you've never had a cheese pizza, you must have never had bacon or a chicken burger because if you'd eaten them, you'd have enjoyed the taste of them, and why would you ever want to give the taste up? And the reality is I know very few vegans, if any, who went vegan because they stopped enjoying the taste of these products. You know, like I said right at the beginning, I was a massive KFC fan, loved fried chicken. I also loved halloumi. Halloumi was, when I was vegetarian, halloumi was my number one thing. I had it pretty much every day. It was just like a replacement, just loads of halloumi. So I ate these products, and I enjoyed them, and every vegan I know did. But that's not the reason why we change, right? The reason to make those decisions isn't because we personally no longer find satisfaction in them. The reason to change is we create an almost a scale, right? So we create this, this, this imaginary scale. And so on the one side, we place the reason, the justifications of taste. On the other side, we place the reason to stop you know, an animal's life. And so then we say, well, okay, what has higher value, taste or life? What do we think is worth more? What do we think deserves consideration, our taste buds or their life? Most people say life, but some people say taste. When we add the argument taste, or when we use that justification, what we're inherently saying is that sensory pleasure provides a moral justification for what we do to others. Sensory pleasure, because of course taste is a sense. I like how it tastes, it provides me sensory pleasure. So then it's, it's sensory pleasure a good enough moral justification for what we do to others. If we apply that way of thinking to other areas, we quickly find out that, of course, that's not true. 
because we can think of many examples where someone feels sensory pleasure at the expense of someone else. And those actions are far from justified simply because of that. In fact, that reason alone makes it almost even more sickening that you would try and justify it because it's such an arbitrary notion, it's such an arbitrary reason. But then when we put animals or non-human animals, the victims in this dynamic, for some reason, our sensory pleasure is worth more than their life. But I don't believe that most of us actually follow that because most of us recognize the intrinsic value of, of life being higher than, of course, the 15 minutes of pleasure that we get from consuming these products, because ultimately that's what it boils down to, isn't it? We have a lunch, we have a dinner, and those periods of time are very short. You know, how long does it take to eat lunch? 15 minutes? Dinner, 15, 20 minutes, maybe? It's such a small amount of time. And yet that period of time, that 15 minutes of time, which is inconsequential in the grand scheme of our life, 15 minutes could have cost someone their entire life, their existence gone, their life nothing but exploitation and pain for a 15 minute moment, something we consume and then we move on and forget about. What did we have for dinner last week, seven days ago? Off the top of my head, I don't remember what I ate. What did we have for lunch four weeks ago? Of course, no idea, right? But that dinner seven days ago, or that lunch four weeks ago, depending on what we purchased or what we consumed, could have cost someone their entire life or contributed to a system where they're being exploited and their life will ultimately be taken. And to us, it's just a mere passage of time, something that's not intrinsic to our health or survival, in fact, quite the opposite, something we consume and just move on with instantly afterwards. But to that animal, that could have been everything taken from them. How do we justify that? Now, of course, we say, well, we've always done it. You know, we've eaten animal products for a long time. But does the length of time provide justification for an action? There are many things we've done for a long time. Of course, killing each other, humans, killing other humans is something we've done for a long time. But we would never justify murder by saying, well, our ancestors used to kill each other, right? I mean, we often point to our ancestors when it comes to justifying what we did to animals. People say, Ed, you wouldn't be alive today if your ancestors didn't eat meat. But my ancestors did a whole host of things that we would never morally justify in a contemporary society. Why would we look to our ancestors to justify how we should live, especially when, of course, the necessities around our survivals are so much different? We had to eat meat to survive in the past. We had to eat animal products to survive in the past, but we don't have to now. Sometimes people say, well, lions eat meat and other animals eat other animals. And if Ed were just animals, then why does it matter? Because other animals do so. But of course, other animals do a whole host of other things, you know? Lions kill each other. But again, we would never justify murder just because other animals do so. And so what relevance does it have if lions eat meat or tigers eat meat or sharks eat fish? That doesn't provide justification for how we should live because we recognize that the moral considerations between those two ideas are wildly different. We're able to make decisions and rationalize and critically reflect and challenge each other and ultimately live, live in a way that reduces suffering. And so morally, is that the way that we should choose to live? Is that how we should be encouraged? Is that the way we should be obligated? So how do we justify it? You know, we recognize that animal farming has a huge consequence to our planet. 33% of all fresh water globally is given to animal farming. The food, that we put into the system, the land that's used, the fact that our population is growing and we're gonna feed more people, but we have finite resources and already 50% of the land in this country alone is used for feeding animals. 25% of the terrestrial land surface of the planet is for grazing animals. And yet our population is growing. And so how are we gonna match that in the future? Environmentally, not great. Studies, research coming out all the time, so switching to a plant-based diet is obligated as necessary is advised for planetary health from an ethical perspective how do we justify what we do how do we morally justify the actions that we partake in when we recognize these actions have victims and a consequence that causes suffering to someone how do we justify it so i've been talking now for 25 15 40 minutes exactly right and so i, I feel like it's important to, to leave time for q a and I appreciate that I've been speaking quite fast and there's probably a lot of information in there. And so if you have thought of anything that you'd like to ask me about, challenge me on something completely different related to veganism, then let's go through it now. But I really appreciate you listening and I hope you found it insightful. Um, and yeah, very grateful for that. So thank you.
Yeah, thank you so much, Ed. That was really thought-provoking. Really enjoyed that. Um, so let's just kick off the Q&A now. So we have a lot of questions flowing in. Um, I just, in fact, wanted to start with my own question, um, which was, you know, how veganism can often be unsustainable as well. You know, how do we make sure that the, the moral side and sustainability side, you know, they sort of align? Um, because often, you know, you can get avocados from South America, which can be very unsustainable. Um, yeah. but so in your personal experience, how, how do we ensure that? Very good question. Um, and sometimes I do longer talks and I always try and address some of these issues and so yes you're right um it's always very important to note that um if something's if something is vegan or plant-based it doesn't automatically mean that it's it's wholly sustainable as a consequence um you know we raise issues um exactly like avocados from south america have a consequence you know almonds in um you know in california have a, um, a consequence obviously these things are less impactful um, but at the same time, there are also plant-based options that are less impactful than those. And so we should, as far as is possible and practicable, look to try and be aware of where our fruits, veggies, grains, cereals, beans, all these different products are coming from as well. And so I think it is about being conscious of checking labels, checking food origin sources, and, and being aware of that. I mean, for, for example, with plant-based milk, it's a really great one because oat and soya are both you know, much more sustainable when it comes to water usage, land usage, energy production compared to dairy. The good thing about oat milk is we can get oat milk that's made in the UK. There's like a, a brand called Minor Figures, it's produced in the UK. Um, obviously, oatly comes from Sweden, but still the environmental impact of that is lower than the dairy. And also we've got Alpro, that I said before, use soy um, from Europe. So we can make sustainable options when it comes to plant milk very easily. When it comes to whole foods and fruits and veggies, again, in the UK, we're, we're quite lucky because we can produce a lot of really good fruits and vegetable crops and um, grains and, and cereals here. So we're quite lucky in that sense. So I think looking at food origin is really important and being aware of it. I think the first thing to do is make that step to veganism and then look to further broaden your horizons. What I like about veganism is it's not an end point, right? It's not once I've made that step, there's nothing else I need to do. But it's a great first step that when it comes to the environment and ethics as well, of course, is the biggest first step that we can make individually. I, I didn't mention it. The five-year study at University of Oxford in reducing food's environmental impact through producers and consumers, it concludes the single biggest thing that we can do as individuals especially, is to adopt a vegan diet because it, it transcends just emissions. Of course, we should be looking at how we travel and look at how we buy clothes and all these different issues as well, they play a part. But when it comes to the single biggest thing, animal farming involves, of course, not just emissions, but like we said before, land usage, water usage, um, crop production, so arable feed and the pesticides and all the stuff that is used within producing arable foods. Um, and that's all joined in together into this animal farming branch. So I want to say to you is to be aware and to, and to research into it, to look to find even more sustainable options on top of that. Um, again, with avocados, we can find avocados that aren't from South America. So if you really want avocados, I think we can get them like Spain and Europe. Um, but of course, it's good to check origins and good to, again, go beyond the duty of just, it's plant-based, therefore a sustainable go. It's plant-based, are there other considerations and can I choose an even better option? I think that's important. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so moving on to a question from Toby. Um, so he's asking, um, how, how do you see the, the veganism movement continuing to grow in the coming decades? Um, for example, do you think it will become you know, a big political issue? Do you think governments will have to take action as well? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I think it's going to progress. But, so I read a report, um, I, I won't say a report, I read uh, an article that was looking into where meat will be in 2040. And I said by the year 2040, the majority of meat won't come from animals, which is an interesting thing. Basically, I think they roughly made it about a, a third split between um, plant-based meat, so things like Beyond Meat, um, lab-grown, so cell-cultured meat, and then meat that's come from a slaughtered animal. That's roughly where they think it might be. I think that was Forbes, although I, I may be off with the actual um, source of that. But that's where they were saying. I think it's an interesting idea, because I think ultimately what we will see in the next decades is lab-grown meat, and it becoming viable and commercially available. And I think that's going to be a big game-changer. Uh, Obviously, it's significantly better from an environmental perspective. You're looking at over 90% reductions in all the main categories that we focused on. So it's really good for the environment. From an ethical point, yeah, it eliminates the need for animal farming. So it's a great thing there. So I reckon that's where we'll be from a political perspective. What's interesting is 
I talked about subsidies quite briefly in, in, in the talk. When we were in the EU, all European members, they received something called the Common Agricultural Policy Subsidy, animal farm, or farmers in general do. 40% of the total European Union budget is spent on subsidising agriculture, which is a huge amount, right? So 3.5 billion pounds just for the UK came from the EU. And of course, we've got the other 26 member states, however many are. So what we're finding now is that because of Brexit and the fact we've left the EU, we're changing how those subsidies have been distributed. So in the European Union, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, that gives farmers the subsidy based on land ownership being in something called agricultural condition. It's a, it's a devastating scheme. What it means is that landowners don't have to farm on their land, but what they have to do is have their land in agricultural condition to receive the subsidy. So what that inherently means is all these fields that we see they're not being used for grazing or for production of foods, but they're owned by landowners who want to claim this subsidy. And so they've completely destroyed the land, which is why it's flat and leveled like that, to receive the subsidy, which is just devastating. That's what it's like all across European member states. So now the British government has changed it. So they're going to be given the subsidy, but they're giving the subsidy to farmers based on more environmental measures. So things like planting more trees, um, having like um, hedged perimeters to increase biodiversity. So they're trying to make it a little bit more environmentally focused. Obviously, it's not going as far as we would want it to, but I think that's going to be a big thing. I think people are becoming annoyed about how subsidies are being used. I mean, obviously, during the pandemic in the US, Trump has given $19 billion to uh, animal farmers to keep them afloat, and we're doing something similar here. And it just feels wrong that our money has been given to an industry to drive down the prices and production of that, even though it comes at such a huge consequence. We should really be taxing these industries that have environmental problems, like, like meat taxes and stuff. But actually, beyond that, the best thing to, be, to do would be to reduce the subsidies that we give to them, because that way we create a truly reflectionate cost to the product. So when we go into Iceland or, or Sainsbury's or Tesco's, we're not seeing four chicken breasts for £2.50, we're seeing four chicken breasts for the price that it should be, if it wasn't subsidized so heavily. And so I think we will see a changing in how agriculture is subsidized by the taxpayer to create more environmental measures and ultimately, hopefully, to encourage farmers to transition to plant-based agriculture or to, of course, um, rewild their lands instead. I think those two things will be monumental. But I think on top of that, just consumers changing, um, supply and demand systems changing, vegans becoming more aware, and ultimately, hopefully, it becoming a political issue. When we become a large enough voting demographic of all of a sudden politicians have to start making sure that their manifestos have policies that would be appealing to us. And I think that's a really big thing. Um, so I think politically we will see changes, but I mean, well, we say that, don't we? But then of course we've just read that Boris and the conservatives are going to be opening up the U S trade deals and allowing chlorinated chicken and all this stuff to come over. So, whether that's going to happen soon, I don't know. But I think what we will see is a gradual progression in that direction of, of course, increased plant-based milk sales, increased plant-based alternatives, increased fruit and vegetable sales, hopefully a changing of the subsidies as a consequence, lab-grown meat coming into the equation and hopefully eliminate animal farming as, uh, as much as, as possible. It's a good question. I wish, I wish we had like a crystal ball, you know, and then we'd know exactly what we could do and how to do it. But I think for now, the way things are progressing, mm. that might well be the... the, the um, steps in the direction. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, Ed. And thank you, Toby, for the question. Um, so moving on towards the next one. So this person is asking, I recently have, have become a more active, active activist. And I was wondering if you how you cope with burnout and backlash. Um, so more, more of a personal comment. Yeah, that's a good, it's a really, really good question. Um, burnout and backlash. I mean, I think it's not an easy answer to this. I think in terms of backlash, you just kind of get used to it. <laughs> you know, I think over time, it becomes a little bit like war off a duck's back. Not as easy as that, obviously, but you become more used to it. And I think you also become more, uh, I don't know what the word is, not trained, but, but used to hearing these comments. And so eventually the comments, I think, just become a little bit more, you know, less, less impactful. The burnout, I think it's really important that you, we always take time to look after ourselves. I mean, it doesn't matter what form of activism you're in. It could be climate activism, it could be civil rights, it could be animal rights and veganism, whatever it is, you're surrounding yourself with very heavy information and information that psychologically can be quite draining, especially if we're watching graphic footage, right? So I think it's always really important that we take a step out and we just take time to enjoy life. Um, that could be hanging out with friends, 
you know, watching films, going to a concert. Well, obviously when, when all these things are possible again, right? But all the things that we enjoy, social interaction, such, it's really important to do that. And I think as vegans, what we can do is we can say, all these animals are suffering and the environment's dying. I can't afford to take you know, a day off. I can't afford to not speak up. I can't afford to not do this. And actually that's really damaging because we have to look after our mental health as well. And so I think we can't be good advocates unless we're looking after ourselves, right? And so I think first of all, we have to get away from that self punishment and just understand that sometimes it's okay to not go and engage in, in that event. Sometimes it's all right not to watch the latest investigation that's happened. Sometimes it's okay to hear someone say something and not try and start a debate with them because ultimately we need to be accountable and we need to make sure that we are in pushing the message, but we also need to look after ourselves. So take time for yourself. That's really, really important. And also in terms of backlash, I think it's good to understand why people say the things they do. I mean, you may have already had this happen. Um, and I'm sure if, if if you're vegan and anyone else watching is vegan, we've all received comments from people saying, oh, bacon this, and oh, I love the taste of meat, and haha, vegans, I can't stand vegans. And that can be quite difficult. But I think it's really important to understand why people feel that way. And if we understand that there's a big cultural reason, there's a, you know, we've been grown up in these environments, we've done it for so long, veganism is seen as impacting people's personal choice and people hold on to that. We have identity around food. We think about Christmas, we think about Easter, we think about celebrations, we think about the fact that food is such an integral part of that and the food is often centered around animals and animal products. It becomes an attack on someone's identity, even though, of course, that's not what we mean to. And so we recognize there's a whole host of reasons why people feel the way they do about vegans. It's not personal, right? And that's why it's important for us to be well-educated, informed, rational, um, and not, not to act from a place of emotion. Now, that sounds tricky, but if we're having an argument or a debate with someone, we, it's really important that we just try and stay, I guess, level-headed and, and we just have a response to what they say because I think that's how we get through to people is by having those responses so being well informed being educated I think is a big part of that trying to understand that people don't say things necessarily because they want to cause offense even though that can be the byproduct of what they do but they're saying these things often as a defense mechanism because of this cultural indoctrination these you know the society they've been raised in the family their identity all of these things has brought them to this point and we're challenging some of the most integral parts of someone even though of course it doesn't feel, you know, on surface value, that's not as always obvious, but try and see beyond what people say. Don't take it personally. Take time for yourself and just try and, you know, have a response to what people say. But it's easier said than done, like, and I'm sorry that it can feel hard sometimes because it can. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is from Jake. So, um, he, so he asks, um, do you think there is a need to include the reality of where food comes from into the national curriculum at schools? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, ideally, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Uh, we, it's funny, in schools, they do have these schemes. Um, not many schools, only a few, really, but sometimes they have animals in the schools. Like, oh, for example, like, you know, you have like, those hatching programs, like in primary schools, where like a classroom will get like a few eggs from a farm, and they get to hatch the eggs, and they get to see like, you know, animals, the hatching process, but then the, the chickens are sent back to the farmer. Or in some schools, they have like pigs on site. There was one school... Um, I, can't, I think it was in Gloucestershire, maybe, uh, maybe it was in Dorset, I can't remember, in, in, somewhere in the UK, and this vegan parent had reached out to me saying that they were raising these pigs, there's three of them, and they were going to be sent to be killed in a slaughterhouse. Is there a way that we could maybe get them sent to a sanctuary instead? The school basically turned around and they said that they couldn't be sent to a sanctuary because they were trying to teach the children about where meat comes from. But the, the children were, were given this idea that there's these three pigs that live outside and have a lot of space and live a good life and then they kill them in a humane way and that's not the reality because they're trying to teach kids where the food comes from but they're not taking them to the slaughterhouse and they're not taking them to the actual farm they we're just we're just given this very idealized and romanticized version of what happens and so yeah i think it would be great if we could have a more honest discussion within schools about that but just more so just eliminate the opposite you know the fact that in schools were so heavily fed the other side of it the problem is until social media and until you know veganism, veganism started increasing we only ever heard one side of this narrative you know about how farmers treat their animals and how wonderful animal welfare standards here and the RSPCA approved scheme and the red tractor scheme but now I think for the first time we're starting to see the other side and obviously the footage is out there the information is out there the studies are out there 
and we're thinking a little bit more critically because veganism has become such a big debate, you know, in, in, in the UK especially. So yes, I'd love for it to be in schools. And I think, well, I, do I think it will get there? I'm not 100% sure if it will for a long time, but I think ultimately if we can get to a point where teenagers and, and, and kids are being told this information, that's good. From an environmental perspective, I've done quite a few talks in schools now to a variety of age groups, some 10 years old, um, up to 18, and of course, universities as well. And what's really wonderful is how much more children have been taught about issues that I was never taught about in school. Climate change was not something I was ever really taught about. I think I had a couple of lessons in science about it where we saw clips from an inconvenient truth. That's really as far as it went. But when I've done some talks in schools where we talk about animal farming and the kids know all about it. They know about like cows and, and, and grazing animals producing methane. They know about the land usage. They know about these issues which I never knew when I was 10 or 11 or 12, I've never been taught them. So I think that the silver lining in all of this is that people are becoming more aware. And actually, when it comes to the environment, this that's something that's been taught a lot more about. So regardless of the ethics, which, of course, we would love for kids to be taught about, like how animals are farmed, not gory, not showing footage, but just more honestly, of course. But ultimately, the environmental question and the environmental topic is being discussed, or at least in, in many schools. And I think that's a really positive thing that will continue. Definitely, yeah. I completely agree with you on that, Ed. Um, and I think a really important question. So thank you for that, Jake. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on towards um, the question from Ryan now. So he, he asks, is eating meat immoral in principle or could eating meat be moral if the animal were killed without any pain or suffering and it had no negative environmental impact? Oh, what a great question. Um, so eating meat can be, eating meat, in terms of a survival situation, you, know, you could justify that. So we looked to our ancestors in the past and we don't say that they were immoral for eating animals because they had to, to survive. But in a modern day society, the issue of morality becomes so pertinent because what we do to animals isn't necessary. Um, for example, um, I didn't talk about it in the speech, but the American Dietetic Association, which is the largest body of diet and nutrition professionals in the world, it has 100,000, just on over 100,000 certified uh, nutritionists, uh, doctors and medical professionals. They stated that it is the position of the American Dietetic Association that appropriately planned vegetarian and vegan diets are healthy, nutritionally adequate, uh, and safe for all stages of life, including pregnancy, uh, when you're children, when you're babies, and of course, when you're adults. And actually, that a vegan diet has, um, is able to reverse and has health benefits that aren't just nutritionally based, but also, of course, come from protecting people from chronic illness. And so when it comes to like, health and uh, nutrition, there's no necessity for us to survive. In fact, eating animal products harms our health in the long run with chronic illness. So that's why it becomes an issue of morality more so, because we don't need it. And so even if you could theoretically, and of course it's not possible, even if you could theoretically uh, kill an animal in a way that they didn't know about it, it didn't cause them suffering, was environmentally sustainable, it would still be wrong because it's still taking life. And we wouldn't justify taking a human life, even if they didn't feel it and it didn't cause them suffering because ultimately taking life would be immoral when it's not necessary. And here's, a, and here's an example. There potentially is that situation because let's say that we go to Romania or Cyprus where they have loads of stray dogs. Actually, you could very much make the argument, couldn't you, that if you were to kill those dogs, that would be very sustainable. But actually, we wouldn't say that it's acceptable to go to Romania and, and, and kill a dog on the street to eat them that would still be seen as wrong. And so I think ultimately it is immoral in principle when there is no necessity and we don't have to do so to survive, which is the situation we find ourselves in. And even if we did manage to find a way to do it that was entirely sustainable, didn't cause pain and suffering, it's still a point of taking life. And the position of veganism is, is the philosophical position of autonomy and that we should try and honor an animal's autonomy as much as we possibly can. And of course, we live in a world where we're not going to be able to eliminate all animal suffering. And of course, we're not going to eliminate all animal death. What we can do is make huge strides to preserve autonomy and to try and reduce as much as we possibly can those actions. And of course, part of that means not killing animals, even in a situation where they didn't feel pain. And even if we could um, make it sustainable, of course, that's, that's what I'd say. But it's a great question. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, so, okay, so moving on towards the next one now. So how would you spread awareness? What would be your advice on spreading awareness, perhaps for individuals or students? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, well, actually, I think campus um, outreach events are really good. Um, so 
like you kindly said at the beginning of the introduction, um, so I'm one of the co-directors of an organization called Surge. Um, and so we are starting a campus rep program. We've just started it before the pandemic hit. So when it's over, we'll be kicking off again. But um, so if you're interested in doing some campus um, work that could be film screens, it could be food uh, tasting events, uh, flyering, whatever it might be, feel free to reach out to us or reach out via email to me if you want and I can help you with that. But I think doing like film screenings is really good. Um, so it could be Dominion, it could be Cowspiracy, it could be What the Health, it could be The Game Changers, of course. Um, maybe you, if you were doing like The Game Changers or something, you could do uh, like some food. So you could have like some nibbles, like work with a local plant-based restaurant or cafe or something to bring in food. Um, get speakers in. Obviously, we, what we're doing now is you know really good having like virtual talks during this time. But when things are more back to normal, you could do a film screening followed by a talk. I think they're really good. Food tasting events during uh, in campus are good. So like having plant-based cheeses, plant-based milks, maybe some plant-based meats. Um, just have an alternative so that people can try. Because I think one of the biggest drawbacks is people you know, know what they like. And I think the prospect of buying something you don't know if you're going to like seems a little bit daunting. So people can try something and go, well, actually, this vegan cheese isn't as bad as I thought it would be. I actually like it. Or I really like, you know, the taste of oat milk in my coffee or whatever it might be. Then they're going to be, people are going to be much more compelled to, to buy it again. So I think tasting events are really, really good. Um, and also VR. So I know Animal Equality, they have like a VR headset that um, I've used several times and, and it's really, really good. So people put the VR headset on and it takes them and puts them in the position of a pig a chicken or a dairy cow so they've got three different videos and um, I've used those in universities and they're really good because you know they, they put you literally in the position so I think if you could reach out to animal equality they could get some headsets or they could come to campus with you um, and they could do some VR stuff so anything like that I think is good um, ultimately another thing you could do is I don't know what the vegan options are like at Oxford or, or in the sections of the campus where you guys are but you could go and try and get more vegan food in the campuses, try and do more vegan events. Maybe you could try and, and, and ask for vegan only days, you know, like different things like that. And, um, you know, try and get more options. Cause again, availability and accessibility is a really important factor in getting people to, to eat more vegan food. And I think that's a, a great way of doing it is just get it out there so people can have the, the chance to try it. So maybe you could try and get more vegan options on, on the menu might be a good idea. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, so a second question from Toby Anderson, and this is um, a bit of a moral one. So, how would you consider the tension between supporting welfare causes of the animals um, and supporting, you know, ab abolition, abolition, abolitionist views? Sorry, apologies. Um, you know, in, in that area. I have a, what a great, great question that is as well. Really good questions. Um, so, I know I've always been. I've had, I've had my world shaken a little bit because I've always been, I've always really hated the idea of welfare. I do hate the idea of welfare because, you know, it perpetuates the idea that there's a right way to do the wrong thing. Um, and so on face value, I, I don't believe that um, we should advocate for welfare. Let, I'm going to kind of disagree with myself in a minute, but uh, you know, on face value, I, I've always been against it because I think we talk about free range eggs. And when you look into what free range is, it's, just you know suffering in a different way so we take animals out of battery cages we put them in a free range which is just one big barn so it's just a glorified cage in the uk a farmer can legally house sixteen thousand birds in one barn which is nine birds per square meter of space right so it's 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 just a glorified cage in fact that the, the rates of broken bones in free range hens is larger than in, in battery uh, pens and so this case is either way fundamentally it it gives people the idea that they can buy these products i used to buy free range eggs and i thought anyone who bought caged eggs was a terrible person even before i was vegan right even before i was vegetarian um not that i think terrible people but i i think i used to think that it was a horribly terrible thing to do even when i bought eggs so i bought free range eggs thinking i was doing something really moral when of course the suffering is, is the same and ultimately they're all killed anyway in the same way but there's a few other things to look at. One of the biggest fears of the animal farming industries is that they will be outregulated. When regulations come in, so when welfare regulations are introduced, it comes at a cost to animal farmers. So when animals are given more space, that means that they can, there's less density stocking or stocking density, which means there's less money to be made at specific time, uh, there's specific area constraints. Um, so they do worry about this and it has a huge knock on effect. Now, the fur industry or the fur farming industry is an interesting one because a lot of countries in Europe don't have fur farming. So for example, a place in Scandinavia, uh, in Germany, 
a don't have for the fur farming. And the reason isn't because it was made illegal, it's because regulations were introduced that made it impossible. So for mink, I think they were supposed to have water areas because mink um, like water as well, but that meant that mink farmers went out of business because they couldn't have the space and they couldn't meet any of the profits they needed. Um, again, with fox fur, they had to have larger space, larger cage, and then that put uh, fox fur farmers out of business because they couldn't meet what they needed to produce from a financial perspective with these new regulations. And so it's not these industries were made illegal, it's just they were out-regulated and it was no longer cost-effective and didn't make sense for the farmers to continue. So I think there is an interesting case now to be made that when these welfare regulations are introduced, whether that's no longer having pigs in gestation crates, no longer having hens in battery cages, whatever those regulations may be, from an animal rights perspective, it's not good because it doesn't actually mean the animals aren't suffering. It doesn't mean they have autonomy. Those things are still denied to them. But what it means is that it's less cost effective for farmers. And overall, these incremental regulations being introduced could be the reason why animal farming is no longer seen a financially viable option. And so I sit in two minds about it because on the one part, the idea of saying caged free eggs contradicts my you know, philosophical values. But my logical, practical, pragmatic brain says it's a step in the direction to outregulating the industry, which could ultimately be a really beneficial thing. So it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a slightly paradoxical one, um, but it's a really good question. I mean, ultimately what we want is for these industries to no longer operate, so to be abolished, but the mechanisms in which we get there might not always be as simple as saying we have to advocate for just abolition to get to that point. Although ultimately that is the point that we want. It's just about pragmatically thinking, how are we going to get there in the most succinct and quickest way? Obviously, it, it's dependent within industries. We look at um, greyhound racing. That's an easier one. Just advocate for the greyhound you know, tracks to be shut down. And that's what we've seen. So there are things that we can definitely just go close it and stop it. And that works. But I think if something is all, you know, huge and omnipotent as animal farming, you know, there's a case to be made that we can supporting welfare regulations along the route of also campaigning for abolition is beneficial. That doesn't mean as vegans we should say that these things are acceptable, we shouldn't endorse or encourage them to consumers, but we could also support them when they're promoted, you know, when you can vote on them, not that we ever have those votes here, but you know, when you can sign petitions for them, it's still worth doing for those reasons. But during our advocacy, of course, I would never say, tell people it's better to do this. You know, we always say veganism's where we should be, but it doesn't mean that we can't support them through like you know, petitions and, and government um, incentives if you know what i mean that's what i think it's a great question though yeah thank you so much everyone for your questions but i'm, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today um i think a really thought-provoking talk from you ed so thank you so much for that and um some great questions to finish it off yeah thank you so much guys i appreciate listening um have a wonderful rest well have a great weekend and uh, i really appreciate it